Thank you. Thank you, Kevin. Um, what Kevin hasn't told you is that he has been whispering in my ear all day long. And as a result, I've been making changes to my presentation throughout the day. It's been incredibly exciting to be a part of this conversation, in part because the issues being raised, the conversations we've had today have global relevance. They have relevance in cities around the world. And Sue asked in the last panel where the better planning system is. and. Uh, I'll take a stab at answering that. It doesn't actually exist. There's degrees of separation. Various systems uh, do planning better or a little bit worse. Um, but there is no archetype model, in part because so much of placemaking is so specific to local politics and local land and local histories. Uh, so I think this conversation that we're having and the challenges that we're talking about um, ought to be a part of a global conversation about how we ensure that we're providing housing for absolutely everyone. So what I'm going to talk to, about today is transformational placemaking and the idea that a place-led approach to transformation is fundamental, in fact, essential to how we move forward here and how we move forward ensuring that everyone is housed across the entire globe. And uh, I'll just begin with a tiny little introduction to Toronto because I've got a lot of slides and I don't want to spend too much time on Toronto. I will talk about it a little bit in my presentation. But of course I have to ask, who here has been to Toronto? Put your hand up in the air. I'd love to see. Oh, okay, so maybe about a third or maybe even, even just a quarter. Well, you are all invited to the City of Toronto. And hopefully I'll do a good sales job and at the end of this presentation you'll think, oh, I've got to get there and see what they're doing in Toronto. So let me tell you a little bit about our city just by way of introduction. We're a city of 2.9 million people. We're the fastest growing city in North America. We're the fourth largest city in North America. We just recently surpassed uh, Chicago in size, which is significant in Toronto because we were founded at the same time as Chicago. And um, we are going through a surge in growth and Chicago has a little bit of a decline. We're the second largest financial center after New York City. We're the third largest tech hub after um, Silicon Valley and New York, New York City as well. Over half of our population identifies as a visible minority. This is something that we're very proud of. And more than half of our population was born outside of the city. So we are a, a city of newcomers, we're a city of immigrants. Our motto is diversity is our strength and we truly mean that. There are hundreds of languages that are spoken in the city of Toronto and we believe it's what makes our city great. We also think really carefully about how newcomers within just one generation can transition into the middle class. That's our objective, that's our hope. And we're doing quite well in some areas. Right now, we have a housing affordability crisis, which is compromising what used to be a given a generation ago, which was if you showed up and you were willing to work hard, that you could make your way in our city. And access to housing is beginning to undermine that opportunity and that dream. We are a big city, but we're a city of neighborhoods. Torontonians identify with their neighbors. Many Torontonians participate in an annual street party and know the people in their neighborhood. And that's something that we're very proud of. I've lived in a few different cities across Canada and Toronto's the first time that I've lived in a neighborhood where I can honestly say that uh, my best friends all live around me in my neighborhood. And part of that has to do with our urban form. Part of it has to do with having walkable neighborhoods as well. But our neighborhoods are a really important part of the character of the city. And lastly, because this is just a really great indicator with respect to one of the transformations that's underway in Toronto right now, that we have 526 million rides projected on our TTC. There's about 1.9 million people ride transit daily in the city. So we are a transit-oriented city, and we're continuing to focus on transitioning to making transit the first choice for getting around in the city. That's a really big part of our urban planning approach. Uh, 69, 70% of residents in the morning commute to work into the downtown core on transit. For people who live in our downtown core, which I'll show you in a minute, in our downtown core, 75% of the population walks or cycles to get to work. That's a product 
of density and the mixture of uses that we have in our core. And this is a little bit of what that looks like. This was our skyline about 10 years ago, and this is what we've done over the past 10 years. So we're actually, uh, we've added a whole new city right in the core of our city um, in, in just one decade. And we're expecting over the next de decade that's going to happen again. This is what that downtown core looks like. We are a city, uh, we're a spiky city and a flat city. Very low density and very high density. The high density is centered in a few different nodes, but mostly in our downtown core. And this is the transformation that's taken place. In the center, you see, if you look at the previous slide, there's a rail corridor. We have underway the planning for a 26 acre park that will bridge that gap in the urban fabric and connect the neighborhoods to the north and, and the south. And the planning work and the engineering work is currently underway for that. Now, lest I give you a very wrong impression of the city, uh, I have to show you this, because this is actually what the majority of our urban form looks like. We have low density housing, and uh, this is our version of Tower in the Park. Uh, this is uh, housing that was built, market housing in the 19, 60s, we have over a thousand of these types of buildings in our suburbs. And these buildings, um, they were a mistake. They were a mistake. They broke all the rules. Uh, they're not mixed use, they're only housing. They're disconnected from the street, so there's no street life or urban life. They typically uh, had very large surface parking lots because the assumption was that everyone, everyone would drive in these communities. So a big part of our work today is an exercise in transformation, adding density, thinking about how we can tr change these communities. So this is the same community, and what we've been doing is adding more market housing, adding more rental housing, and adding the amenities that are needed to create a truly pedestrian environment. So this community previously was completely disconnected from the transit our transit infrastructure. We've added a subway that goes out to this site, and as part of adding the subway, we've added a significant amount of density. So there's different types of transformations that are taking place in different parts of the city responding to the earlier legacies of built form that exist. What I'd like to do today is really focus in tightly on one central idea, and it's this, that the places that we design and build are either going to contribute to the flourishing of our societies and our long-term sustainability, or they're going to detract from them. And what matters about this statement is that there isn't an in-between. It's not one or the other. There isn't a halfway. And unfortunately, I think a lot of our communities that we've been planning and designing with an emphasis on sustainability and placemaking, we've been getting them partway right. And because we're getting them partway right, they're actually still wrong. And we heard Sue reference the urgency. Our house is on fire. We no longer can afford to be delivering communities halfway. We have to deliver them all of the way. They need to tick all of the boxes. And I'd like to suggest that this means our city building, our community planning, needs to be driven by a significant amount of intention. And just at the outset, to pause and to think about the intention that should shape our city building, I'd like to just throw up a couple of questions. The first one is this. How do we, in our city building, advance the Paris Accord with the urgency that the world requires? This isn't about years and decades to get it right. This is about taking what we know today, putting a stake in the sand, and fundamentally delivering urban habitats in a different way, a way that is inherently sustainable. That's the first question for us to ponder and keep at the top of our minds as we walk through this conversation on placemaking. The second is this. How do we create inclusive cities during this last and final wave of human migration? We've been in this an epoch, if you will, of over 400 years, really initiated by the French Revolution when we began migrating into organized societies. The challenge that we face today is that we are primarily living in organized urban places. And as a result of that, we're seeing a fight over resources take place. And I believe that this fight materializes in our politics. Who's in, who's out? 
That's what building a wall is about. Who has accesses to the resource of a place and who doesn't have access to a resources of a place? So the question when we think about our cities has to be how do we create cities that are welcoming, that are places where diversity is not only recognized and welcomed, but cherished and adds to our quality of life? How do we ensure, and this is the next critical one, that prosperity is shared? The great irony of our times is that as our cities have become wealthier, they've become poorer. As our cities have become more prosperous, they've also become more exclusionary. Some people have been in and some people have, have been out. So as we think about placemaking, as we think about design, this question of inclusion and this question of sharing prosperity needs to be at the heart of our city building just as much as creating sustainable societies is at the heart of our city building. And that leads us to sort of a tough question. <laughs> Which principles do we embrace and which principles do we abandon? There's things we've gotten right, we know that. But there's obviously things that we've gotten very wrong. The new urban crisis as articulated by Richard Florida is about a consolidation of wealth in our cities that has led to exclusion that has been by design. And that's why I wanted to begin this conversation with the word intention. What will our intentions be in our 21st century city building? What kinds of cities will we create? What big burning questions will drive and inform every part of our work moving forward? Well, I'd like to lay a little bit of some groundwork, if you will. I'll call this starting points. And these are some of the things that I actually think are really easy. Everyone in the room is going to agree to this. Now, how these starting points materialize, well, that's where it gets really tricky. But the starting points are the things that I think we can say as a, as a baseline for advancing our town planning and our city planning and our community building, these starting points are at the forefront. The first being this, that we need to prioritize clean land, air, and water, that that needs to be a first priority. The image you see here is the largest green roof in the city of Toronto. It's uh, uh, at City Hall, and it was created as a result of a policy framework where we began requiring green roofs on all buildings, all new buildings, public and private. So when we make clean land, air, and water a priority, then that has direct implications and ought to have implications in our policy frameworks and what we require of new development. So this is a really good example of that. It's a large green roof, which also acts as a water absorption feature. It's a critical part of stormwater management in a part of the city where there happens to be a tremendous amount of concrete. But I, no one's going to disagree. Clean land, air, and water needs to be at the fore of our city building. That has implications, but I think we can agree with that, on that. The second is this, that walkable, inclusive, mixed-use neighborhoods that are a part of complete communities ought to be at the center of our city building. This is about recognizing that if we want to shrink our environmental footprint, one of the key ways that we're going to do this is through how we move about and how we use land. How we use land is directly related to how we move. It's not just about the gas and the diesel that cars consume. It's also about the space it's about that wasted resource of land that comes from planning communities around cars that end up underutilizing one of our most precious assets. So planning walkable and inclusive mixed-use neighborhoods, and they need to be mixed-use to deliver on the promise of walkability. Because if you can't get anywhere on foot, there's no destinations other than more houses within walking distance, it's not much of a walkable community. So I think that's another, at the principal level, most of us can say, oh, yeah, that's a, that's a good thing for us to be aspiring to, to be a foundation in our 21st century city building. And here's an image of what that can look like when we start thinking about the right of way and how the right of way gets divided up to deliver a very different kind of city where the focus is on moving, moving people instead of on moving cars. We also know that the best cities that are going to have long-term resilience focus on a diverse economy. People are always a little bit surprised when the uh, world economic crisis happened in 2009. It didn't actually happen in Toronto. 
Uh, it didn't really happen in most of Canada. We're like this weird little blip on the map. It didn't really happen to the same extent in Australia either. But in Toronto, one of the reasons why we had some immunity is because of the diversity of our economy in, in our city. We still have a really strong manufacturing base. We have a large tech industry. We're also the financial heart of the city. Uh, ed education and medical research and services are significant in the city. The service sector is significant in the city, as is tourism. So the diversity of the economy, economy built in resilience. When the housing uh, economy began to collapse, well, that was a portion of our city, and we felt it, but not in a significant way, not enough to, not enough to call it a recession. So thinking really carefully about the kinds of economies that we're creating in our cities is essential. Also ensuring that we have comprehensive, high quality, and also affordable transit that is in a network that links into cycling and walking. And in many of our communities, we simply don't have the density to support a real transit network. And instead, we have highly subsidized infrastructure that doesn't operate at a great frequency, it might be reliable, but it doesn't come very often. It's not really a, a real transportation choice, which is why it's hard to get people out of their cars onto transit. So as an aspiration, we know that getting more people using transit as part of their everyday lives, and that being a first choice, is a critical part of creating a sustainable and inclusive city. And we have to ask, what would happen to your design thinking if transit first became a design criteria? Immediately, there'll be implications about how you think about density, because you can't get transit service without density. You can't get a high frequency of transit without density. So if transit as a priority enters into our thinking about new community planning, it means we have to think very carefully about density in a fundamentally different way, as well as design. We also recognize the importance of green spaces of all sizes that bring people together, anchor communities, and also welcome visitors, knowing that green spaces can be the fabric of community life, of connecting people to one another, generating a strong sense of belonging, and also contributing to our mental and physical health. That leads into the next one, which is recreational opportunities that integrate into everyday life and everyday spaces. Sometimes you see on a map a area that has a wonderful cycling network. And then you get to that place and you don't ever really use the cycling network. Because the cycling network is purely recreational. It's for a family on Sunday morning. It's not actually about movement. It's not actually not about your everyday life. The opportunity is for us to design recreational opportunities as part of our everyday life. We've been through an unfortunate area where we've designed all the physical activity out of everyday life, and we have a global obesity crisis as a result of it. So our city building needs to focus on reintegrating recreation into the core of everyday life so that it's possible to get around in an active way. This is a, um, a remediation product, an adaptation in our city. We've created a new public park, a linear park underneath our Gardner Expressway. Uh, we are a winter city, a cold city, and in the wintertime, it is a skating track. And it's right adjacent to 50,000 new residences, right in the core of the city. We also know that our natural places, and we're in a setting that does this exceptionally well, need to be respected, celebrated, maintained, and appropriately used. We went through a crisis many years ago. We had a hurricane in the Toronto area. And we realized as a result of that hurricane that we needed to think very differently about our river valley system. So we have all kinds of river valleys that run through the heart of the city. And as a result, we changed our environmental policy and we identified those river valleys as being critical green infrastructure, crit providing a critical ecological service to the city that allowed for human habitation. Now, they're also recreational spaces, but they play a critical role in ensuring that human life is sustainable over time. So integrating this into how we think about the design of our cities and our towns is, of course, fundamental. We know we need cultural facilities that can both honor our past and lead us, help us understand our future. 
I think we're at a moment in history where the humanities have never been more important. Uh, when I was going through university 20 years ago, everyone was taught, it was all about business and science, business and science. And over the past five years, I think we've, uh, we've seen a rise of all kinds of things that I th thought a lot of us were tucked pretty deeply into the past, like authoritarianism. Uh, a rise in all kinds of political movements that really come from a lack of understanding our own human story and our own human history and what has happened uh, not that long ago. Cultural facilities are an important part of remembering and telling our story to ensure that we can advance as a civilization. I don't think this is something that's flippant. It's critical to uh, human civilization. Of course, beautiful architecture and excellent urban design that both astonish and inspire. In this image, you can see that the, the cyclist gives you a sense of the scale. This is a public art installation that continues into the podium of a building. This is a podium. And uh, it astonishes <laughs> when you walk up to it. It, it. it causes moment of reflection and lingering in the landscape of the city. That is the opportunity of expressing our humanity through design. And then lastly, we've talked a little bit about this today, uh, but in many ways it's really at the core of everything that we're doing here, is ensuring that we're providing housing that is affordable, and Neil made the distinction, or someone made the distinction about affordable housing, and I, I would say the other way of saying that is housing that people can afford. So there's the market housing that people can afford, and the challenge that we see right now is that a lot of market housing people can't afford. People who should be buying market housing. Young professionals with two jobs who cannot afford market housing. That's a housing that people can afford challenge. And it's a challenge that is global. And it's a challenge, I would argue, that has been linked to the free movement of capital globally and the way housing has been turned into a commodity as opposed to about human habitation. And I, I loved the last panel because the last panel was about, it was about pulling that back, turning housing into housing again. And this ought to be a key focus of our, of our city building. So if we can agree, I don't think too many people will disagree with that high level aspiration, that vision that I've painted of what we can achieve in our cities. The question becomes how, how do we do this? How do we make this happen? And I would like to suggest that you need to change the conversation to change the city. And I do think we've been stuck in some old conversations. And I even think we're struggling with some of our language and how we talk about the city and we talk about city building and placemaking, how we talk about it in such a way that we draw people into the conversation. I don't know exactly how the, we do this, but I, I have a few clues from some of the work that I've done and continue to do. And one of them is this. We need to mobilize a new generation to both engage and lead in city building. In 2015, Toronto was named the most youthful city in the world. Uh, and this is a global survey that's done, one of these great rankings that if you win it, you talk about it loudly. If you don't, you ignore it. We won it, so we talked about it loudly. But in that ranking, there was an area where we scored very poorly. We scoured the results. And the area that we scored very poorly was in civic participation of people under the age of 35 in our planning processes. So in city planning, we hold hundreds and hundreds of meetings a year. I decided to start collecting some data on who attends the meetings. And I told you at the beginning what Toronto looks like, what our demographics are like. Well, after a year of collecting data, I found out that in our public meetings, our workshops, our charrettes, our tours, our participants were overwhelmingly white, overwhelmingly homeowners, even though 50% of the rent city uh, are tenants, and overwhelmingly over the age of 65. So we have a problem in our city building, and I don't think this is a phenomena unique to Toronto, because I see it in cities that I go into all over the world that there is a generation that needs to be mobilized to see cities and how we design our habitats as being a part of the solution to the greatest challenges we face. And the exciting thing about being a planner and engaging in building and designing places, it's such a hopeful act. It's such a hopeful thing to do. 
And here we have a generation that knows that generations before have squandered our globe. City building is an opportunity to be a part of the solution. We can mobilize a generation to participate in city building, but we've got some barriers. I hired a youth research team. This is my youth research team in the city of Toronto. And I had them go out and interview youth to find out why aren't youth participating in city building. And we discovered all kinds of barriers to entry. And one of those barriers was that young people don't see the relevance. Now, if you ask key priorities of young people, they will say access to housing, access to transit, uh, global warming and climate change, our climate crisis. These are all things young people care about deeply. But the connection isn't being made between how we design how we live and being able to mitigate the greatest risks that we face to human survival. So this is part of the solution, is mobilizing a new generation to engage and lead in city building. Um, there's another solution, and it has to do with how we do our public consultations. So I'm just going to give you a three-minute case study. This is from a strategic planning exercise in a city of 600,000 people in the city of Toronto. Imagine suburbia, American-style suburbia, as far, as far as the eye can see. That's Mississauga, where we did this study. And the question was, how are we going to become a sustainable city? How will Mississauga become a sustainable city? So um, people weren't really that engaged in the city. So we created a whole variety of different mechanisms for engaging people. We engaged over 100,000 people in this consultation process over an eight-month period. What we were able to do as a result of that was create what we called drivers for change. Because we recognized that there was no point talking about changing the city if people didn't think it needed to change. So what are the drivers for change? What are the reasons why the city needs to be planned and executed in a fundamentally different way? So through these consultations, we took everything that we heard and we compiled them into drivers for change. And you can see here, we synthesized all of those ideas and we came up with 18 drivers of change for change. And you can see them, uh, and you'll recognize some of them as being ones that are, are relevant here. Affordability was, of course, a really huge one. Also, people were already talking about the importance of placemaking. The fact that there was nowhere to go in the city was a really significant issue. Um, the, the assets of the city were really hidden. The things that made the city a great place to live. How do we get those hidden jewels? and capitalize on those hidden jewels. So these 18 drivers of change, which came from this massive consultation process, led us to create five strategic pillars. And those five strategic pillars became the foundation of a new strategic plan. Now, why am I telling you all this, this little mini case study? Is because we did this 15 years ago. There has not been any wavering in the city population or politically in implementing all of the strategies. We created an action plan that came out of this. This has been one of the most effective plan implementations that I've ever seen anywhere in the world. And you know why? There's a shared consensus around the drivers for change. It's not just about the solutions. We can talk about the solutions. Should we create walkable communities? Yeah, let's create walkable communities. People need the why. They need to know why this matters. So in Mississauga, we started with why the city needed to become something different. And because there was enormous buy-in to those 18 drivers for change, there's a very, very high level of consensus around these five pillars for transforming the city. A very, very high level of consensus that continues to this day, that has resulted in things like being able to attract two universities into the newly developing downtown core, building out 26 kilometers of light rail transit in a city that was not a transit-oriented city, upzoning along that transit corridor to create a linear urban space within the suburban, suburban city. People are tolerating a tremendous amount of change in this city because they buy into the drivers for change. And I think sometime as urbanists, we actually skip that step. We go into the design details, but we don't spend enough time building the consensus around why. 
And when we do, people are actually going to be pretty happy with the solutions. And they don't care that much about the solutions if they believe that they're designed to address the things that they feel need to change. So that's the second piece. We need to mobilize a generation. And the second piece is I believe we need to spend more time working at the grassroots level, building a shared consensus around what needs to change in our cities. So what I'd like to do is spend the rest of the presentation talking about a proposed shift, a proposed shift in our city building and in our design. And it is a shift from an emphasis on buildings and infrastructure, let's lay down infrastructure and put down buildings, to focusing on creating places, places where people will flourish. And this is a very different, this is a very different framework than just building buildings. And I believe it's a value generating framework. It's also a framework that involves complexity. And I'll talk about that a little bit more in, in a minute. This is the framework that I'd like to propose. It's really rooted in three big ideas. That every place has design attributes, every place has assets, and every place needs a whole series of programs. Now, buildings are the fabric, but the programs need to be overlaid. And ideally, it's done in a way that respects the assets and enhances and elevates those assets and also includes key design attributes. Now, the challenge is you can, you can recognize your assets and you can get the design attributes right, but if the program is missing, you won't have a place. The assets really matter. One of the ones I have in there is design with views in mind. One of the very interesting things about being here in Milton Keynes is that I was sitting in the little town square on 12th Street at lunchtime and I was looking out and every direction that I looked in, the view terminated with something that was not really very desirable. So for example, uh, when I looked straight out in this direction, I saw a parking garage. That parking garage stopped me. If I saw the terminus of a beautiful building or a gateway or a public art feature or a public space, it would pull me in. It would give me a reason to go there. But instead, the view actually terminated the experience and resulted in, for me, a lack of curiosity. I didn't get up and walk down that corridor because I could see there was a parking garage at the end of it. It wasn't very interesting. So building on assets and thinking really carefully about the design around those assets is essential. Ensuring, for example, that the walkability is connected into the program is really essential as well. You'll notice that I've put in here child-friendly because I believe this is a piece that we frequently miss when we're thinking about complex environments. I'm going to talk a little bit more in the presentation about the different programs, but the one that I want to highlight is live workspaces in new housing forms. One of the number one reasons why people uh, go into big urban cities and centers is because there are buildings that are being adapted, there's different housing types, non-traditional housing types. It's why artists typically end up gentrifying neighborhoods. It's because they can find unconventional housing forms. So our question needs to be, if we're interested in creating a place, how do we create unconventional housing forms, a whole variety of forms, a mixture of different types of housing, both tenure, owner and rental, but also design, lofts alongside of houses for families, for example. We also know that great places have a whole variety of things that you can do, and there's a convergence that takes place from those different uses being in close proximity. That's what happens in big cities. We can do this in smaller places, too. The place that I know that is a similar size to Milton Keynes that does this the best is Portland, Oregon. It's Portland, Oregon. S Portland, Oregon is about 300,000 people. Portland, Oregon has all of this, every single piece. It has the diversity of housing types. It has social innovation incubators. It has local micro retailers. It has services to support innovation and entrepreneurs, R&D, education. It's got every single one of them. Food markets, all of the pieces that start to create human interactions and generate a real sense of community and a real sense of place. Now, imagine you create a walkable place, but you don't have any of this. What are you walking to? A sidewalk, a sidewalk isn't enough. That mix of uses is essential. So three key 
uh, pieces that I'd like to suggest that are essential to being able to deliver on this placemaking framework. The first is moving minds, which I've talked a bit about already, but this idea that we need to think in a different way, which is part of what we did in that Mississauga process when we created those 18 drivers for change. We were challenging people to buy into thinking about the city in a fundamentally different way and doing so based on some of the things that needed to be fixed. I'm also going to talk a little bit about embracing complexity and density because there's a risk that we will never get to that place-making approach if we don't embrace both of those things. And lastly, I'm going to show a couple of examples of advancing adaptations, and I'm going to do all of that in five minutes. So moving minds. Uh, this is an image that was in our official plan in the city of Toronto back in 1970s. We have put it right into our planning framework that a fundamental part of creating the future city is moving minds. It's getting people to think about the city in a different way. And every city that I've ever worked in, people say to me, well, here we like our cars. Every city I've ever worked in, as if that's something unique. Cities that are designed around cars are not sustainable. They also will never be able to deliver on the critical mass that will create a really strong sense of place. Those two things are in conflict. So one of the things I said at the beginning is that we sort of have to make some choices. Which principles are we going to continue to embrace and which principles are we going to abandon? And I would argue that if our objective is to create a fabulous place, if our objective is to start creating some of the complexity and critical mass that can create real places that are sustainable and inclusive and have value over the long term, we're going to have to abandon the assumption that a strong place and a strong community can be designed around cars. I've actually never seen it. I've never seen a place where it's worked. So we've got to move minds. We need to think in a fundamentally different way. In order to think in a different way, we have to be honest about some hard truths. We've got to call some stuff out. The first is this. Technology will not save us. So autonomous vehicles, out the window. Autonomous vehicles don't solve anything. Instead of, autonomous vehicles are no different than having a city where you've got a really high supply of taxi drivers, right? One of the good things about autonomous vehicles is that many of us will no longer need to own cars. We'll only use them when we need to. That's a good thing on a space planning side, and we should be reducing our parking uh, requirements in anticipation of that. But autonomous vehicles will not change the landscape of the city. They will not make the city more sustainable or a more interesting place. They will not create critical mass. Uh, they're based on the same flawed assumptions as cars are in cities. The second is that innovations are not required. And now I'm going to say a little qualifier around this because the last session, which I admitted to you at the outset I loved, was called Housing Innovations. Uh, what's interesting is that much of what was discussed in the last session were actually old ideas. A kit of parts for houses, which is brilliant and wonderful. Well, we did that in the 40s and 50s. We need to come back to that idea. Most of the solutions that we need today, almost all of them, they already exist. We've got to find the right ideas and make choices and advance that which will deliver sustainable and inclusive cities. The next is this. The solutions that we, we seek for the future can be found in the principles of the past. If we go back to timeless principles of urbanism, we'll find many of the solutions that we're looking for today. And there's a big move, I don't know about here, but in my city, there's a big move, like there's some big technological fix out there. That's what the whole smart city movement was about. Ooh, Cisco's gonna, going to get involved and then traffic congestion will evaporate. Well, of course that didn't happen. Just moving cars more quickly through the city meant more cars came to the city as a result of induced demand, and we didn't get any further ahead. So we need to go back to some of those timeless principles. And I'd like to give you an example here. This is the King Street Pilot, uh, which is a project in the city of Toronto that I advance as chief planner. This is our most important corridor running right through the heart of the city. It runs through many neighborhoods. Hundreds of thousands of people live along this corridor, and it runs right through the financial district. You can see here the, the traffic volume of vehicles and pedestrians. Now the problem is the streetcars moving many people every day moved very slowly, slower than walking. Our innovation, our innovation 
to implement a pilot to shift from focusing on moving cars to focus on moving people to improve the public space and to support economic prosperity. So we created a pilot project. We shamelessly copied the model from New York City that Jeanette Sadat Khan had introduced. And before the pilot, the big problem that we had was that cars, you can see the big red streetcar there, that cars were getting in the way of streetcars and slowing down the streetcars. So our big magical solution, restrict traffic, get the cars out of the way. When we did our data collection, we discovered that cars used 64% of the space in the corridor, but they only moved 16% of the people moving in the corridor. The transit was doing the heavy lifting, but it was getting the leftover spaces. So we redesigned the corridor, we created new public spaces curbside, and we restricted vehicle movement in the corridor. This is what the corridor looks like today. An amazing thing happened. This is now the busiest surface transit route in North America. 85,000 people move along this streetcar corridor every day. The increase in ridership in the evening is 44% higher in rush hour. So what's interesting about that, we didn't build anything. All we did was change the policy. That's all we did. There wasn't really an innovation required. There was a public policy required that was ba based on a vision of creating a more sustainable city. So less people are now driving in this corridor. And this is some of the interventions. We're now making it permanent. So it was just approved by city council to become permanent. These were some of the interventions that were done on a temporary basis, including public art installations. And we collected a tremendous amount of data, including economic point of sale data for the businesses along the corridor, because we wanted to make sure that in changing the corridor, we were supporting economic development and growth. The next key area is embracing complexity and density. The risk, of course, is that we think there's a shortcut, but we know that monolithic cultures don't work very well. They underutilize infrastructure, so if you just have houses, all day long, those roads are empty. All day long, those toilets don't flush in a residential neighborhood. When you have a mixed-use neighborhood, the amenities and the infrastructure are being used by different populations throughout the day. So embracing complexity and density is about delivering a sustainable environment. And the challenge is we can't get, we can't get an environment that is going to be transit supportive and suitable for walking if we don't have enough density. And this is the risk, I think, in the conversations today that jumps out at me the most. The risk is that we create really, really, really green suburbs that aren't really very green. And they're not really very green because they're reliant on populations driving from one place to the next. There's a tremendous amount of opportunity right in the core of the city for infill that can be done in a way that's in keeping with the character of the design here. There's massive surface parking lots right along this corridor that if they had buildings on them would add a vibrancy that currently is missing. So the opportunity to build up in the existing areas is a really big part of the opportunity in thinking about where those million new homes should go. And it begins with recognizing that density is your friend. That density can make existing places that are a little flat, successful, by adding a critical mass of, pieces, uh, of, of people. Gentle density can conform to and accentuate existing characters. So in existing neighborhoods, how can laneway houses and secondary suites and add-ons to existing buildings add density that will then make a corner store viable, that will then make adding other community amenities or nonprofit organizations part of the fabric of a neighborhood? We know that walkable, transit-oriented communities require density. And we often plan communities, and we call them walkable, but we don't give them a hope because there isn't enough density to provide the critical mix of use to make walking a real choice. Now, this is our green belt in the GTA. And I'm showing you this because it links together how the biggest policy framework connects with what happens on a specific site. So we've restricted growth and we're directing growth to our existing built-up areas. This is right in the core of the city of Toronto on our subway line and a streetcar line. Now, this site is currently being redeveloped, 
And what's interesting about this site, it's called Mervish Village, is that there was no pressure opportunity to add new density on this site until the green belt was put in place. So that highest level policy framework and determining very clearly where growth wouldn't go was essential to driving growth into existing areas that already trap transit and that already have infrastructure. So this is what was on the site before. I know it looks pretty crazy, but it was actually a city, a city landmark. Uh, it was a massive big box store. And this is what's going on the site today. Now I'll tell you a few things about this development. It's 720 rental housing units, 20% of which are affordable. There are 28 heritage buildings as a part of this that are being integrated into the new development. It's a LEED Platinum development. Uh, we require LEED in city policy, but not Platinum, so this is the, the highest standard. It, of course, has green roofs as required by city policy. There's a Woonerf going through the center of the site that will become a new community gathering space. Now, the density is really important to this because the liveliness comes from having density, uh, having lots of people that can actually s support the activities here. But we also have micro retail. Remember that place graphic that I showed you and I had all those programmatic elements? Well, this little laneway right through the heart of the site has been saved for entrepreneurs. And these are actually subsidized spaces for small scale retail to create identity in the site, but also to create an energy and an atmosphere around this, around this place. We've also added a new park and in the background there you see a new public market which will be open all year round. Now, just to put a sweet, sweet cherry on top, we decided to have very little parking associated with this development. There's almost no parking. What does exist are spaces for car share and we're very proud that we're going to have our first ever, we call it a Dutch style valet bicycle parking. So you'll be able to take your, your bike and go below grade uh, via valet. So the emphasis here is all on walking, cycling, and transit. Now the last thing that I'll just quickly go through is advancing adaptations. And I just have a couple of slides here. This is a very typical kind of street in North America. And um, you know, I think for most of us, we look at a street like this and we sort of want to weep. Um, there's so many things that are wrong here. But we went through a very extensive community process as a result of the fact that we're building LRT along this corridor. And our city council has approved this plan. And this plan is about fundamentally adapting and transforming this environment to become something different. So you see mid-rise housing, a green corridor with the LRT, separated cycle tracks, wide, uh, widened sidewalks with green infrastructure. There is retail at grade. There are spaces that have been designated uh, for workspace. The opportunity here is to think about what it is we'd like to see in our cities of the future, to envision it in our mind's eye, and then to put the policies in place and to do the hard work to make it so. Thank you. Thank you very much, Jennifer, for um, a fantastic discourse from setting out the, the issues, the people, the addressing the drivers of change, getting people to buy into that from that incredibly detailed survey that, that seemed like, I don't know if anyone's done anything as big as that in terms of scale in, a, in an eight-month period, but getting, really engaging with people, not jumping to the answer before you've had the discourse about the direction of change. Um, some fantastic solutions. I know many of you have been involved not, not only in trying some of these things, arguing for it in certain places, and, and sometimes getting stuck. So I think it's nice to see some of these ideas uh, where, just as we heard with the Rotterdam example this morning, you keep going, you just do it. Um, but that issue of doing it with people who've bought into it was, was a hugely powerful message. What, what we've got time for are some questions or comments. Again, can you please restrict yourself to 60 seconds, uh, really just to give the chance for others in the room to, to have a say. Anyone got a comment or a question on what they've heard? Uh, do you mind if I pass? Because you, you, uh, I'll come back. But you, you... Anyone new got something to say? <laughs> I'll come back to you just to give some other people a chance to. 
Hi, Michelle McGuckin from Glasgow City Council. I have a question relating to, co to collaboration that was incredibly impressive and very inspiring. Um, but it, it couldn't all have been easy. How do you engage with the coalition of the willing and sort of um, compel people or inspire them to be involved in projects like that? How did you manage to persuade people to re restrict growth into such a tight space? So the first thing I'll say that um, of everything that I sh have shown you in this presentation, none of it was remotely easy. All of it was very, very hard and painful. It's reassuring, really. <laughs> um, well, I think sometimes it's good to hear that because we sometimes think, oh, it must be easier there. And I know I've fallen victim to that, too, where I see another city and I go, well, I can't do that in my city. You wouldn't believe the politics in my city. It makes it way too hard. Uh, so it's important for you to know that um, it, it, all of this was hard. <laughs> uh, but part of it is, I think, having a process that has a tremendous amount of integrity and then slowly building the coalitions and the interests that um, can advance the vision and share the vision. And it does start with having a really clear vision. So to go back to the King Street pilot, which I just showed you. So we've had a, a battle in the city about the war on cars. There's a war on cars. And so with the King Street pilot, um, before even bringing that to city council, I started working with the media and we did a series of newspaper articles on best practices in other cities of the world where people were prioritizing pedestrians and transit over cars. So that we started to build some buzz, build some conversation around it. And then I went to our mayor who's very tepid and uh, pitched to him the idea of doing it and he said, oh well, only if you'll test it. He didn't, you know, he wanted me to stick my neck out, which I was totally happy to do because I cared about advancing that change. And we had huge blowback. There was even an ice sculpture made of me. Um, <clears throat> remember that? There was an ice sculpture on King Street by one of the business owners who didn't like the pilot. Uh, he made an ice sculpture and said about, you know, it was a picture of me and the mayor. And um, so there was a lot of blowback initially, but the, we built the coalition <coughs> by having a clear, uh, a clear vision, generating significant data, and building an understandable narrative that could connect with people no matter what their interest was, and then using data to support it. And so, which again is something that we sort of stole from the Bloomberg team, um, telling the story with data. So the business owners would say, Oh, we want the cars. So the business owners want the cars for drop off and pick up. And we would say, oh, we want the cars. Our business is going down because you've taken away the cars. So we collected point of sale data. And we started doing it a year in advance. And we're still collecting it today. And we've been able to demonstrate that business has gone up. But of course it has, because there's tens of thousands of more people coming to the corridor. Because now, what used to be a 40-minute commute is a 17-minute commute. That's what we did to commute times with this change. Massive, and it's why we were able to add so much capacity and move so many more people. So I think it's, it's, it's that vision, coalition building, finding constituencies who are sympathetic and working with those constituencies to build out the narrative and to build out the tools to deliver change. Thanks, Jennifer. Anyone else who hasn't had a go yet or come to the others? Yes. So Simon Pugh from David Lock Associates. A question for you. Um, there's several senior figures from Milton Keynes Council in the room. Um, the city is looking to double in size in the next 30 to 40 years. What would be the two biggest bits of advice that you would have for those people in the room currently? Oh, that's a great question. Um, <clears throat> my first advice would be that the strategy needs to begin with areas where there is existing infrastructure and existing opportunities for adding gentle density. Not because it's better for the environment, although it is. Uh, not because it's going to reduce commutes, although it is. But because you need the density, you need the critical mass. That the risk is that you won't have a really strong beating heart if you continue to spread if you can continue to spread your energy out. And this is a mistake that um, 
many suburban municipalities make where they keep adding at the edges and then trying to attract businesses into the core and can't figure out why, they're, why they won't come. So creating that critical mass, that would be the very first one. Uh, the second would be, I think you need to wrestle to the ground how people are going to move in your future city. How are they going to move? Uh, because your streets can be redesigned while keeping the incredible pastoral character that you have. I, I think this is an absolutely magical place, which is why in that placemaking graphic, you've got to look at your assets because you don't want to compromise your assets. You want to build out your plan from your assets. And I think the pastoral nature of Milton Keynes is really something very precious that ought not to be disturbed. But creating a way for people to move that does not depend on a car <clears throat> is going to be essential to whether or not you really become a very vibrant place. And uh, you want to attract young people. And cities that don't attract young people uh, uh, die. So you want to attract young people, and young people don't want to own cars. <laughs> they want to walk and cycle. And that's what's happened in our downtown core. We've, we didn't mean to do this, but we ended up creating this mecca for young people. And car ownership is very low in the core of our city. And it's also a, a much younger demographic because people were willing to pay a little bit more for housing in exchange for not having to own a car and being able to walk and cycle to work. So if you want to attract young people, you're going to have to wrestle down the role of the car in the landscape of the city. So those two things. I've got two here. I've got Audley and then Derek on this side, and then we'll take some in the middle. Probably. Thank you. Very interesting presentation. It had me thinking, though, you mentioned about climate change. Um, when I travelled around Canada, I noticed that a lot of buildings is obviously made from timber, and I'm looking at the buildings that are going up there, and to me that seems to be being made out of concrete. I mean, where, how do you then um, equate that with, and why aren't you or Canada investing in using timber to build higher, to bring, bring down their carbon footprint? So uh, this is a really good question, and we've been having an active debate about this. We, um, we are. Well, the, the short answer is that we're making that transition. We now have a Mass Timber Institute at the University of Toronto. We have our first tall, t tall timber building is under construction in the city right now, and there's several more that are planned. So we are in the process of making that transition as we speak, and there's a recognition that we need to. Uh, timber is more expensive in Toronto, significantly more expensive than it is in BC. Uh, in British Columbia, timber buildings have advanced much more quickly because it's less expensive than concrete. But in Toronto, there's a shipping cost because the lumber has to come from Quebec, which actually makes timber a more expensive product. So the economics of building with timber haven't quite been favorable yet, but uh, the Mass Timber Institute is doing an amazing job of raising awareness and actually uh, creating more interest in building with timber. And we have just changed our building code to make it easier to build with timber as well. That was another one of the constraints. Thank you. Derek? Uh, you're obviously referring to increasing density, uh, but we come from different bases in different places. Mm -hmm. Uh, do you have a sort of, uh, do, you, do you have a figure where you say this is really the density we need to achieve to support a transit system? And this, this is, um, and what is that figure? What is the, what, what are you working to? Because uh, we can talk about some densification here, which still wouldn't meet uh, the, the transit requirements, uh, which would already cause some, some uh, raised eyebrows, so to speak. But it'd be interesting to know where you see that level as being. Well, I don't think there's a number that you can pull out of the hat because it depends on a whole variety of design considerations. Most of your uh, neighborhood areas are never going to have a density that would support having frequent transit going to them, which is why thinking about a cycling strategy, uh, because they're incredibly easy distances to cycle, but because the cycling network is designed a bit more to be a leisure network than a transportation network, there isn't a logic to use it. Uh, so we've just made this shift in Toronto where we've fo we're focusing on building out a grid for our cycling network. Before we had a great leisure network. You could go along the waterfront, you could go down the ravines, but that meant it was a circuitous route to get to the subway station or to get to work. 
So we've been building out a grid so that you can go the shortest distance between two points on your bike. So this is why I think you need to wrestle to the ground movement overall, because it's not one golden goose. There's a role for transit, and it might be that having less uh, of a very, very infrequent service that must be highly subsidized and putting more of the emphasis into creating excellent cycling infrastructure, that could be the golden goose here. And electric bikes can be an important part of that for people with mobility issues as well. Bikes can be very accessible. I think there were two in here. Sorry, there's one right at the back, Jazz. Okay, you can see. Yeah. Hi, uh, it's uh, James Varley of L&Q. Um, is creating an arc between two cities that are two hours to drive outside of rush hour and have no train connection and will eventually have one but will be quite local, is, it, is this the right place to build a million homes? Sorry. I, I mean, I, I hope it is. <laughs> <laughs> Well, I think the arc as a theoretical construct is a little bit tricky because people won't live in the arc. People will live in a neighborhood and people will live in a community. And so the question, I think as, a, as an objective or a target, it makes sense, but not as a planning framework. As a planning framework, the next question becomes, well, where within that arc do we create a critical mass and do we create the densities to, to make livable communities within that arc? So I think it's important not to mistake the arc itself for a planning framework uh, and to focus on creating that planning framework. You know, uh, Milton Keynes itself needs to have a really clear strategy about infilling existing areas. And there's, there's lots of areas where you can infill here without compromising on the character or quality and without going very high. You don't need to go high. You don't need to, I actually love the low rise character. Um, but there's lots of area where you could strengthen the quality of life by adding some density. Yeah, <clears throat> Jennifer, I'm, I'm sold on the uh, proposition to go to Toronto. I've not been, so I'm, <laughs> I'll put that on my uh, uh, itinerary for the next, um, next summer. Come in the summer, not the winter. <laughs> <laughs> I'm interested in you, you've, you've, the techniques you use to start the conversation. And that conversation is obviously diverse and uh, involved the business community and uh, various groups in the neighbourhood. But what about sustaining it? Because um, I'm looking at the image here and I'm thinking of going to Toronto and I want to go and talk to somebody about that. Mm -hmm. Who do I... It, is, is that um, uh, conversation still going on? I mean, you're here. How, how are people... Mm -hmm. And addressing it, mm -hmm. and how relevant is it now to the to the future? That I mean, you've you've, you've moved on from that that role, and have mm -hmm. have others taken it up in in city hall, or is it the um, are are other local groups feel empowered to to drive it on? Mm. That's a great question, and I probably will give a bit of a a bit of a biased answer, but I think that. Um, I think that we have had a very high level of civic engagement in our city for a long period of time. And then we've had moments where there's been a real, really high level of disillusionment because of things that have been done around the decision making. And people kind of go away and disintegrate. And then there'll be a crisis and people kind of come back again. But when I was a chief planner, I had um, community leaders from six or seven different organizations organize a meeting with me. And they came in and sat down and said, what can we do, what can we do as they were foundations, one of them was a think tank at the university. They said, what can we do to help advance the message that you're talking about, to get it out into, get it out into communities? And so we sat around the table and we created a joint effort. And so when I left, those, there were constituencies that were talking about these ideas and advancing these ideas that have continued to do that. Um, I continue to do it. I write for our national newspaper now. I write a column. That's part of how I do it. I also have a podcast. I do it on, on Twitter to the extent possible. It's a bit rough in there sometimes. Um, but I think that there's, there needs to be a whole variety of different ways to facilitate that conversation. Uh, and my podcast is called Invisible City. And I'll just make this connection because I talked about the youth strategy. I created the podcast because when we did the youth strategy, 
And you said, we really don't see how government is relevant. And we asked the question, how could we make it relevant? And overwhelmingly, one of the responses we got was a podcast about city issues. And so one of my nephews, who's like 26, he's right in that age category, who's a musician, he, he said to me one day, hey, Aunt Jen, why don't we make a podcast? And I was like, oh, fits perfectly with our youth strategy. So that's why we created it. So a variety of different, a variety of different ways of having the conversation. And I think this is a really important part of just civic discourse more generally, because I think what's happened is a lot of our civic discourse has been co-opted by media outlets that define and build a narrative that's very disconnected from how people, how people live and how people feel. And part of our job as urbanists is we have to find a way to reinvigorate that meaningful conversation about our shared future. Thank you very much, Jennifer. I think you've made the case for us all to go to Toronto. Um, this isn't a small offer. Paul Ostergaard, one of our academicians from North America, suggested a Pittsburgh Toronto trip and actually started looking into planning it. So that's maybe something we should actually look at seriously. I'm going to have to draw it to a close because we've got some things to do to, to tie up. There's still a chance to catch up at the end. But can we thank uh, Jennifer for a fantastic keynote presentation. <laughs>